directors of the ARE. Uh, he is a fascinating speaker, tremendous sense of humor, and he has that earmark of all the people of the ARE, a brilliant mind, a truly open heart, and an approachability. And he is a wonderful speaker. And let's have a big Earth Keeper round of applause for my brother, John Van Ocken. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And so my job today is to deliver to you the story of our souls as given by Edgar Casey. And I have a journey to take you through that uh, still fascinates me as we go through it. We are not who we appear to be. But of course, most of you know that. So I'm really kind of speaking to the choir here. So I've made it as entertaining a uh, talk as possible. I want to fulfill your expectations, your needs. That's the goal here. OK. We are light emanations from the source of light, celestial lights temporarily sojourning or incarnating in physical bodies. And Edgar Cayce saw the light of each of us. He naturally, from the time he was a little boy, saw auras and lights around each of us. He also saw things beyond the aura, uh, light beams from other dimensions occasionally. He also saw your aura shift as you changed your disposition in talking with him. Like he explained that uh, if the aura shifted to a limey green, he knew you were exaggerating. So Edgar the fish was this big. Well, maybe this big. <laughs> uh, also, he could tell when you were becoming amorous with him because the rosy red would come up around your aura and he enjoyed that a great deal. <laughs> One time, he was in New York City and the elevator door in the hotel opened and he saw no auras around the people on the elevator. He stepped back and would not get on. He was a, a momentarily in shock. The doors closed, the elevator malfunctioned and they were all killed. And then he realized why there was no aura. The souls had already left. What was standing in that elevator was the shell that they had used, but the light had left. You see? so. There's a lot of evidence for the fact that you are light beings temporarily sojourning in a terrestrial reality in this uh, physical vehicle we call a body. Here's Edgar. He says, you are a light, a ray that does not end, lives on and on until you are one with the source of light. And this light is your soul mind. This is your soul mind. And if you can get more and more familiar with that part of yourself, then life becomes richer and more meaningful and you grow. Our life began in infinity and Edgar's big about the finite trying to experience the infinite because that will help you grow and still remain balanced in the finite reality. So our life began in infinity at the moment light was conceived in the infinite mind. And Edgar says that light, quoted in Genesis, was the light of consciousness. Consciousness is the key. Growing in your conscious awareness, expanding your consciousness is the key. Now in this, I always felt this little star right there is me when I look through this massive field. We are all here. All of you are in this slide. <coughs> And interestingly, this is the um, prototype of beingness, of individual consciousness, which is called in uh, the scriptures and in ancient cultures, the Logos. And here you actually see John start his gospel out in a very strange manner. Um, <clears throat> In the beginning was the word. Now, I've read this in Greek, and you can do it too if you use a lexicon. In the beginning was the word, and the Greek word there is not the English word word, 
but the Greek word logos, which means so much more than the English word, word. Logos is the essence of all expression. It is that original consciousness that expressed itself. Also, there are no masculine pronouns in the Greek version, the original version. It says, this one. So in your English Bibles, when you see he or him, it wasn't in the original. Here it is the way it was done in the original Greek. In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. So you see how John's struggling to kind of keep you in oneness, even though we live in separateness. The Logos was with God, but it was also God. You know, it's tricky. The same for us. This one was in the beginning with God. All things were made through this one original consciousness. And without this one was not anything made that was made. In this one was life. And the life was the light of humanity. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. If you're familiar with Hinduism, this is very interesting because Brahman is like the womb of the mother creative universal consciousness and Atman is the expressed part coming out into activity and individualness and expression. And so you see him sort of balancing these two here, bringing them together. Edgar Casey takes us on this wonderful journey saying what our soul longs for is it is seeking home. And he points out that the English word home has two letters in the middle. Um, you know. And here's what he says. Here are the quotes. As the entity moves from sphere to sphere, it seeks its way to the home, to the face of the creator, the father, the first cause. Casey identifies the first cause as that the created would be the companion for the creator. This is the reason we were created, and as a result, the created, our soul mind, consciousness, our soul mind, is given opportunities to, quote, show itself to be not only worthy of, but companionable to the creator. Now, we're talking about the creator of the entire universe and everything in it, and you don't want to be a dull companion. So you're to be up and at them, living life, using free will, engaging, getting involved, growing, learning, experiencing it all. So you are a very interesting companion. So be up and at them. We did begin as immature psyches. And we are on a journey of enlightenment of that initial consciousness. But you must understand it was pure, immature, and um, you could not have discerned it from the creator's mind until we used the gift of free will. As soon as you were motivated to use your life consciousness or reacted to something, you began to have a unique story of your own. And Edgar said, that is the soul story. And that's what he read when he gave you a reading the story of your soul's use of free will and experience with others and the universal consciousness. The process of m maturing this psyche you have, of going out and engaging, and the Creator wanted this to occur, even though it was risky, is called individuation. Now, you all know this in your lives because any of you who have had children or can remember your own childhood, when they're little and small, they, don't, they can't discern their flesh from your flesh. They're cuddly and sweet as can be. And then they grow a little bit and they might run away a little ways, but they always run back until they become teenagers. <laughs> now you know what individuation is. They engage their will, and all they want are the keys to the car. No more advice from you. <laughs> Dad, I've heard what you have to say. Can I have the keys? <laughs> this is individuation. Casey describes it this way. 
The purpose of the heart is to know yourself, to be yourself, and yet one with God. The purpose is that you might know yourself to be yourself, and yet one with the creative forces or God. Don't put the material first, the earthy, for you have to live with yourself a long, long while. Become acquainted with yourself. Know yourself and the relationship to the creative forces. This is the goal. This is the journey. This is the deep motivation of your soul. Psychologists define individuation as a process whereby the innate elements of your persona, the different experiences of your life, and the different components of your psyche become integrated over time into a well-functioning whole. <clears throat> and a lot of growth occurs by you engaging with other people. You are born into a challenge. You uh, may be hired by a challenge. You may marry a challenge. You may give birth to a challenge. And this is soul growth. <laughs> they stir up everything in you and you are trying to put it all together and in marriage you will certainly learn the weaknesses and uh, less than desirable qualities of your being that you never knew you had <laughs> so engaging with others is an important part of soul growth uh, Edgar Casey says that over and over and you are on this process that tries to integrate all the different aspects of yourself. Now, he recommended um, Ospensky, who's a philosopher, and Ospensky explained that you don't want to too quickly try to integrate everything going on in you or about you. You want to take your time and discern, as he says, what is really truly you and what is false you, he calls it. So engage life and watch how your personality and your innate psyche all engage in the dynamics that are set before you because these dynamics are karmic, good karmic, in an intent to help you address issues that will help you grow. So don't try to rush to do the I am too quickly process, grow, and determine where they are. And gradually you will start to feel the true self, the greater self, the enduring self, that is what Edgar called the better self. <clears throat> and you will eventually be in that zone. Now, we are being told, uh, not by Casey or metaphysicians or mystics like me, that we are stardust. Physicists, scientists are telling us this. And I have one of the big ones here. Lawrence Krauss, and he says, every atom in your body came from a star that exploded. And the atoms in your left hand probably came from a different star than the atoms in your right hand. It really is the most poetic thing I know about the universe, he says. You are all stardust. You couldn't be here if stars hadn't exploded because the elements, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and all the things that matter for evolution were not created at the beginning of time. They were created in stars. So forget Jesus, stars died so you could live. <laughs> now don't get upset with Lawrence. He, he's talking about your body. Jesus is talking about your soul. Uh, Lawrence is pointing out a, a physics perspective on the physical body. But we do have the essence of the celestial, and Edgar Cayce calls us star travelers. Here's one of his readings. <clears throat> As an entity passes from this present time or this solar system, this sun, these forces, it passes through the various spheres, on and on through the eons of time and space leading first into that central force known as Arcturus. Edgar Cayce was talking about stargates long before the movie and TV show. And Arcturus, he said, was the stargate in and out of this solar system, near the Pleiades. Eventually, an entity passes into the inner forces, inner sense, 
then they may again, after a period of nearly 10,000 years, there's no time to the soul, enter into the earth to make manifest those forces gained in its passage. In entering, the entity takes on those forms that may be known in the dimensions of that plane, which it occupies. There being not only three dimensions as of the earth, but there may be seven in Mercury, or four in Venus, or five in Jupiter. There may be only one as in Mars. There may be many more as in those of Neptune, or they may become even as nil until purified in the fires of Saturn. He's not talking about the planets. He's talking about the dimensions that the planets represent. <clears throat> he explains that this solar system is like a university with colleges and each of the planets in the solar system represent a college with a, a focus of a certain development of your being. Um, and he's not talking about three-dimensional planets, he's talking about fourth and fifth, uh, fifth dimensional aspects. He says it's very similar to classical astrology and here's how he gives it. Mercury, your soul would go to Mercury to develop the mind, mental development, reason, order, and the like. Venus, the heart, the music, arts, love, creativity, healing, and the like. The Earth is the causal dimension. We're cause and effect, where one finds an active opportunity to use free will for growth. Oh, you think you're this way? We have a place where you can prove it. And we will set up a stage, just like Shakespeare said, and give you a role to play with other actors that you're not necessarily thrilled about. <laughs> and you will engage in proving yourself. Mars is madness, it's power, everyone's freedom to use the life force in forceful ways, sometimes to benefit and the other to woe. Jupiter is high-mindedness, high ideals, large groups, the masses. Saturn is where insufficient flesh is redone. Ooh, starting over, the changer. Edgar Casey had a lady come to him one time and ask for her past life reading and while he was in trance giving it to her, he said, oh, here's a soul who's gone to Saturn often and God loves one who's willing to start over. <laughs> Yikes. <clears throat> Uranus are the extremes, most astrologers would agree, and the psychic. He explains that psychic are actually the natural senses of the psyche, which is the soul, he says. The five senses of the body are one thing, but as you become more soulful, as your mind expands and you become more aware of your soul self, you naturally get the senses of the soul which are what we nickname psychic abilities. But he says they're natural. They're natural to your soul. Uh, Neptune, the mystic, direct contact with God. Water, of course, very watery. And Pluto is consciousness, according to Casey. Of course, the scientists recently demoted Pluto, but now I read there's a movement to bring it back into the fold. <laughs> Uh, we have a lot of this in this little book we put together of nothing but Casey readings on planetary influences and sojourns. And now I want to show you how this actually works. Edgar Casey's soul, prior to incarnating as Edgar Casey, sojourned in the realm of Uranus, developing his psychic ability, but he also had the extremes. He was extreme. Harmon Bro shared with me that the copier ran out of paper one day and he stuck his nose into Edgar's office and said, the copier's out of paper, we don't have any paper. And about four o'clock that afternoon, a uh, truck pulled up with a three year supply of paper. <laughs> and Harmon said, no, we just need two reams. And uh, that was Edgar, you know, he, he, he had this he could be very, very good, Tib shared with you. He has a brief sojourn in Venus, and he comes in as an individual who cares about people, loves people. Individually, he gives readings one-to-one, -one, and he writes very individual letters to people, very personal. His sister Lila didn't do this. 
She sojourned prior to her incarnation in Jupiter, high-mindedness, large groups, the masses, and she had a brief sojourn in Mercury on her soul's way to incarnating. Her mental skills, logistics, all of this, she incarnates and becomes one of the top executives of the International Red Cross. You see how it works? He said it was not so much that the planet was in that position, but that your soul had experienced those dimensions. He did astrology a little differently. Okay, since we're here, we might as well study the College of Earth. The realm of cause and effect, the realm of testing. Uh, if you go to the book of Job, God actually turns to Satan and says, test him. The book of Job starts out, the sons and daughters of God came before God and Satan came among them. God turns to Satan and says, have you considered my servant Job, how good he is? And Satan says, eh, you touch one thing of his physical body or his physical property in life, he'll curse you to your face. And God says, test him. In ancient Judaism, Satan was the tester the tester. And of course, you probably know how badly Job was tested, but he never curses God. And eventually God comes to Job and says, Job, I'm going to ask you a question. And I want you to think carefully before you answer it. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Now, Job's about 60 years old. So a pretty tricky question. But the answer is you were with me. You are sojourning in this dimension, and it's very dense and very captivating, but you were actually with me when we started this whole process. Yep, we do incarnate. Oh, no! You're drawn into it. Oh, my gosh. Bam! But you can't maintain it. The body lets go, and you're back out there going, what just happened? <laughs> but now you've developed this situation in your soul that you have to go in and now you stay longer and it gets a little more interesting, little more fun, but bang, it doesn't work and you're out again. Darn. But the forces are still there, or as we say, unfinished business, karmic attraction. Uh, did you hear what she said to me? I'm going to get back with her and figure this out. And you just keep this cycle going. <laughs> and going. This is one of my favorite slides. <laughs> now, you don't have to die to have that experience because sleep is a shadow of death. And Edgar says, every night, while all these bodies are asleep in these beds down here, their souls are free to leave. And you can do the same every night. That's why Casey was so big on dynamic sleep, budgeting time to understand your sleep cycle and capture your dreams and learn the language of the dreaming self. Um, really, while your body surrenders itself, unless it ate a pizza at midnight, it's not going to happen if you did that. But let's assume your body's in pretty normal shape, goes to natural sleep, your soul is free to leave. And I don't mean three-dimensionally travel. I mean expand out into its beingness beyond physicality. Do you see? Your outer self, your personality has suspended its presence. Your body is in a stasis, totally letting go, and the soul's free to experience it. Often, Casey said, passed on loved ones are easy to communicate with during sleep because you're in the soul dimension, and so are they. Um, dreams come back to you and he says you have to understand you're in your fourth fifth seventh dimensional self and now as you're going to wake you have to translate that into three-dimensional imagery and so that's what a dream is an ability an effort to translate what occurred into a picture story that the outer self can eventually understand um, you have Com intimate connection with your soul and are very familiar with it and I'm going to prove it to you right now. How many of you have been having a dream or a nightmare or a vision during your sleep or a certain sense of energy dynamic going on and as you're coming back you notice your bladder's full. So you say, I'll just go empty the bladder 
and then come back and work on this dream. So you go, empty the bladder, come back to the bed, and what? How's that possible? I had this. I had this totally. You just experienced the two parts of yourself and the veil between them. So subtle a veil that as you engage the somatic nervous system to move the bladder to the bathroom, you didn't notice you moved through the veil. So subtle. But when you came back, the veil is so opaque, you can't see back through it. You're in the guy only in charge of the bladder. He didn't dream the dream. He has no idea of the content of the dream. Now, if you lie down on the bed and sort of linger back, you might slip through the veil again. And with the associative process, you might get a little of the dream. And then as you go along, you get more and more of the dream. Often when Casey was asked for dream readings, he would say, well, you've got a portion of the dream. Here's the rest of it. And that would freak me out. Do you mean there's a level of consciousness at which even my dreams are fully recorded, even though I can't remember all of it? And this guy can read it? Yeah, he said, thoughts are as real as actions. In fact, when he was giving you a reading, he had a very difficult time discerning whether you just thought about doing it or did it. Well, I read that when I was about 20, and it ruined my life for two years. Uh, somebody should have told me about this. Oh my God, my thoughts are making an impression on a collective consciousness that Edgar can read. And then I read the reading that said, new thoughts overshadow old thoughts, and I was ready again. <laughs> I spent years, every time a thought came up, I go, no, not that thought. <laughs> It really changes you when you think thoughts are things. They are as real, he said, as a poke in the eye. My late wife and I used to try these little efforts at times with each other. So we said, okay, we're going to go a week, and you're never going to think negative about me, and no negative thoughts, and I won't think negative about you. We would make it about three days, and we'd, you're thinking bad about me. <laughs> I'm trying not to. <laughs> Thoughts are as real as a poke in the eye, real action. So then you really start to work with your thoughts. And what happens is part of that process actually gains some power over you. And when your mind is more, when you're more aware of your mind and it's processing, these sleep periods are fantastic opportunities for celestial connection, communication. Not every night. Edgar said, those that make an impression on you or stir you a bit are the ones you need to work on. And of course, he said, if life's real busy, you're having trouble, or you've got three young children like we did for a while, there's no way you can uh, linger in bed because <laughs> you have to get up and get going. But if you can budget time and start working with it, you have access to your higher self during the sleep cycle because it is a shadow of the death cycle. Uh, we travel in soul groups, according to Casey, and the biggest soul group are the morning stars. And again, he takes us to the book of Job, in which you have this quote, the morning stars sang together and all the children of God shouted for joy at the coming of humanity. I don't know how you feel about it now, but at the time we thought this was a cool idea. <laughs> we are the morning stars human on this planet, even though now we've broken into judgmental groups and, and um, all sorts of isms that keep us separate and make us uh, judge others negatively, we're all of one soul group. Here's the Egyptian uh, story of this in Ramses III's tomb. Here's the actual wall photo that I took here, but here's a little uh, cleaner schematic so you can see what's going on. Um, first, I want to point out to you, can, I, can you see my little red thing o that far over? No? Let me see. Um, if you look on the right side, you will see birds' bodies with human heads holding a rope. Do you see it on the far right? In the little schematic up here, you see a boat coming down over a lion. Do you see that? Okay, that's the lion of yesterday. Now look to the left and you see a boat coming out of this world over a lion. That's the lion of tomorrow. Or what they called the Sphinx. 
the sphinx of the eastern horizon and the western, the rising sun and the setting sun. So this is your journey out of heaven into matter and out of matter back up into heaven. So here you see a dung beetle's body with a ram's head. That is, you are entering the dung world <laughs> at the time of Aries, at the time of the beginning. The Egyptians looked around, how can we convey their soul? And they said, well, it is them, but it's them that can fly higher than the body. Okay, we'll put a human head on a bird body and that'll be the symbol of their soul. And they called it the Ba, B-A, the Ba. So here you see the souls coming down out of heaven yesterday into the dung world in the beginning age into monkey bodies. See the monkey there? That's a baboon monkey. And Hermes comes with them because that's the symbol, Hermes the baboon. And you will have lifetimes looking back. Now, if you go down to the original wall, you will see on the right that everything's done in black. That is not negative. It's uh, immature, undeveloped. Uh, so that was a period of, of not realizing the whole truth. We were still immature psyches, but we were powerful because we were celestial children, children of God. In the middle, you see the circle with these huge arms and hands. The Egyptians said, how can we convey their spirit? Spirit is the life force, soul is the story. And they said, well, let's put their hands in the position of adoration and remove their heads. <laughs> it's not the thinking, it's not you, it's the essence of the feeling you have when you're in adoration, that spirit. Wasn't that a clever way to do it? And when they do the arms and hands really large, it's the great spirit. And the circle is the great consciousness of Ra, and we are all rays of the great Ra. They used to pronounce it Ray, but we all pronounce it Ra. We are the rays of the great Ray, and that is with us the whole time. Now, as we rise out of here in the future, you notice that the boat rising up has the dung body with the ram's head slightly shifted and souls honoring it, and a bird on the bow. See the little bird on the bow? So now you're coming out of the monkey body, the baboon body, light as a bird. And what is pulling you up out of it? Human-headed cobra bodies. Do you see them? Now, in the video, there's the little bird body, and there's the baboon body, and here are the hu uh, human-headed cobras. See? Lion of yesterday, lion of tomorrow. <clears throat> the secret, you're welcome. The secret to understanding human-headed cobras is that the Egyptians looked around and said, how can we convey to them the life force that they need to raise in order to pull themselves out of this? And you have to go to Jesus and Nicodemus to get the answer, believe it or not. Nicodemus is a member of the Sanhedrin, leadership of the Jews. He sneaks away one time and asks the master for some insight into the mysteries. And of course, the most famous thing Jesus says is, you must be born again. And Nicodemus, being a very earthy man, says, how can I climb back into my mother's womb? I'm sure Jesus went, oh, this is going to be hard. <laughs> He says to, no, Nicodemus, that which is flesh is flesh, but you must give birth to your spiritual self. See, the second birth is the birth of your spiritual self, which occurs in the womb of your consciousness. Okay? Then the second thing he tells Nicodemus is no one, no one ascends to heaven who didn't first descend from heaven, even the Son of Man. All of you are heavenly beings, who came here. In fact, at the Last Supper, he turns to doubting Thomas and Philip, and he says, you know where I'm going, and you know the way. And of course, like you and me, they say, what? We have no idea. I said, oh, yes, you do. Latent within you is all of this that you've done. Your descent from heaven into matter is latent there. In fact, Edgar Cayce was once asked, uh, what will it be like when we uh, get fully illuminated? And the scan answered, familiar. 
He wouldn't let go of the fact that you're a heavenly being, even though your ego and your flesh has taken you over. He would not let go of that. It will be familiar because you are actually a heavenly being. So the third thing Jesus says to Nicodemus helps us with the cobras. Amazingly, Jesus says to Nicodemus, as Moses raised the serpent in the desert, so must the son of man and the sons and daughters of man be raised up to eternal life. Now Moses was well educated, so he would have immediately Moses, the desert, oh yes, he left Pharaoh and Egypt and all the wealth he had because he got a sense that he might be someone else, something else about him. He might belong to something bigger. So he went out into the desert to search for his true self and for God. Now watch how this author does this, it's really clever. Moses comes upon a deep well around which seven virgins are standing. Give me a break. <laughs> this is not common in the desert. <laughs> this guy's trying to tell me something else. The seven maidens cannot water themselves or their flocks because all the other herdsmen keep pushing them away. Moses, one guy, drives all the herdsmen away and waters the seven maidens. Get the idea? the seven spiritual centers from the deep well of water in the desert of this world. Then the girls tell him a secret. We're the daughters of a high priest. Whoa! Just happened to have seven virgins of the high priest standing in a well when you went searching for your true self in God. He goes to the tent of the high priest and marries the eldest daughter, the highest spiritual center, the highest chakra. Then he has an illumination in a flaming bush. That bush, <laughs> if you go to the New Testament, where does the Holy Spirit appear on the holy women and the disciples? Right over the crown chakra, right? That's probably the same thing that happened to Moses when he saw God in a flaming bush and God said, Moses, raise the serpent off the desert floor. Nicodemus might have even realized that not only did Adam and Eve fall in the garden, the serpent fell also. The life essence, you drew yourself down here and lowered your vibes and God is saying to Moses, Moses, if you want to come up on this mountain and meet me face to face, you have got to raise your life force because you're running at 33 RPM <laughs> and I'm vibrating at infinite vibrational level. You got to raise the serpent off the desert floor. And Nicodemus would have realized right then that this teaching is about raising your vibrations. Not only do you have to expand your consciousness, but you have to raise the life force from your lower chakras up into your higher chakras. Edgar Casey explained the four lower chakras are of the earthy energy, the three upper of the heavenly energy. In a few minutes, we're going to see Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, and this will be clearer to you. So here we are coming into the earth and now we're trapped in the cycles that Buddha explained to us, the enlightened Buddha, cycles of birth, life, death, and rebirth. And I've drawn this little schematic. This little drawing at the bottom is the Egyptian depiction of the light consciousness of souls uh, reincarnating. It's called the, in, re, the reincarnation of Ra and the rays. The little circle on the top of her head on the far right that is where it begins and it goes right to left, is your soul mind coming into a body for the first time and then notice there's a flower and a star above her. The star is your spirit and the flower is the sowing of your seed here. Your actions create a certain karma here. You sow it, then you die. You see the line taking you back out to the circle again. You have a sojourn beyond incarnation. You come back, you reap what you sowed the last time and sow new seeds and the cycle keeps going over and over. And this is the Egyptian de uh, depiction of reincarnation. I just wanna point out a few things to you. The body you're incarnating now was not the body in the previous life. We buried or burned that, right? But Edgar says, in your mind is the memory of that. 
And so you do influence the body, even though your parents give you a new gene pool, your mind influences. That's why how many of you, like me, have had multiple children and not one of them are the same? <laughs> right? And physically, Doris and I had a gene pool and they don't look alike. <laughs> In fact, I'm a little concerned about one of them <laughs> might not be mine. <laughs> not so, really, just joke. That's because, Edgar says, the soul influences the body's development once the soul comes in. We'll see more of that in a minute. So I want you to know you've got a new body here, and Jesus actually refers to this. He says, uh, you leave... Uh, your, your house with the seven devils, you go out and we cleanse it and you come back and bring seven devils back into the new house. And everybody went, what's he referring to? He's referring to the seven chakras in your new body that you come back into. The, I don't want you to be misled by this drawing because I drew it evenly. Uh, incarnations are not even. Uh, some of these lower lines actually could be only four months long. For example, Edgar Casey gave readings to newborn babies in New England who had just been killed a few months earlier in the bombings of London. See how fast they came back? So their line would be real quick. He and Rudolf Steiner, you're familiar with Steiner in Europe? They were contemporaries, Edgar Casey and Steiner. They say the soul does not come into the body all at once. It comes in in stages. The first stage, Edgar explains, is somewhere close to the birth of the body, 24, 48 hours before or after. So someone said, well, what keeps the body alive if the soul's not there? And he said, the spirit. Spirit is the life force, soul is the individual. And he said, sometimes souls linger and think, do I really want to do this? <laughs> and? Uh, he says sibling order could change if the firstborn decides, you know, I don't want to do this and pulls away, the second comes in. And then usually the first gets daring and next time there's a baby opportunity, it comes in and it resents the firstborn talking to it like it's superior because it was supposed to be first. Edgar would give readings and explain these things to people. Um, Sometimes your incarnation can be very long, and then the top uh, half circle there uh, in soulful sojourn could be extremely long. He said some Atlanteans left here and didn't come back for thousands of years because there was nothing here to interest them. So you see, it's not as even as I did. It could be these, uh, circle, these half moon circle cycles could be shorter or longer than what I drew evenly here. But eventually we stop incarnating. He actually gave readings for people in which he said, this will be your last incarnation. That's interesting, isn't it? Uh, you, can, you are a star being, you can do things elsewhere. You don't have to be here. <clears throat> We travel in soul groups. Most of the people in your life today you have known. Most of you in this room, we have all been together at some cycle of incarnation, very likely, most likely Egypt, Atlanta, something like that. You travel in soul groups and that builds relationships, soul relationships. Now this is a soul group, but <laughs> these are the shy lights. And when I was a young man, they had two hit songs that I loved. <laughs> oh, girl, and have you seen her? And they're the only people I think could wear these suits. <laughs> but of course, this isn't the type of soul group I'm talking about. I'm talking about this type of soul group. Edgar Casey explains to us that this is not simple. It's somewhat complex. So assume that the red circle in the middle is you and all the other interconnecting circles are other people in your soul group. And let's say the bluish violet one are your intimate souls. Father, son, daughter, sister, brother, lover, um, all of those sort of uh, intimate relationships. But even they could have connection with other souls. Look at the uh, lower light yellowish one with a blue circle in the middle. That shows you that some of your soul group may actually have had experiences in a group you never had experiences with. So he doesn't want you to think it's very simple. 
I'll give you a living example. <clears throat> For about 20 years, Edgar Casey gave health readings. That's all he gave. He, he was a psychic diagnostician, big long term for his health readings. One time he was in Ohio giving a health reading and the individual got frustrated by it and said, well, why do I have this illness? And Casey calmly said, because in a previous life in France as a monk, you abuse the body and this is the karma of that situation. And everybody freaked out. Whoa reincarnation so the whole family wanted to get readings past life readings they were nicknamed life readings and everybody gets a series of incarnations one of which for everyone was as an in incarnation during the time of Jesus except Edgar's wife Gertrude well she didn't like that very much she told him listen I love Jesus as much as you guys and she pouted about that. And, and you know, if you're a married couple, you got to live with this woman. So he said, let's do a check reading. <laughs> she was up for that. So he goes into trance and here's how he did it briefly. He put his hands over his forehead and he saw a white light. Once he saw that white light, he would move his hands over his solar plexus and he would start to go into deep breathing and rim, rapid eye movement. He was falling asleep. He was moving into the subconscious. Gertrude, his wife, or his eldest son, Hugh Lin, would give him the suggestion at that moment, you will have before you the inquiry, and that light would move, and he would follow the light to the hall of records of that soul. And the keeper of the records would bring out the book of life of that soul, and everything you have thought or done is in there. Oh. <laughs> So, she, they say, you gave everyone an incarnation in Palestine when Jesus was there, Gertrude. And he comes back sort of edgy and says, the suggestion you gave me was who was incarnate. Gertrude's soul was the guardian angel of the disciple Andrew. And if she hadn't helped him, he would have fallen off the path several times. Well, whew. Needless to say, Gertrude was happy about that. <laughs> this is okay. <laughs> but do you see what that means for you and me? If you love someone, if you are into caring about others, and you are not incarnate, you may actually be a guardian angel to an incarnate soul that you know needs your help. Isn't that something? You can be a guardian angel. Now, Edgar does explain that the angelic part of yourself is your primary angel. He says, the angel that is you. But here's another soul's angelic self helping you because it loves you. How many of you have had a deceased loved one come to you at times of struggle? Yeah, see, it's so true, I love this. So we travel in soul groups. Then the main soul group is the morning stars. This is the soul group of every soul on the physical planet Earth. Now get this, Edgar says there are souls who never came here. They are having similar experiences elsewhere and different experiences. He says during the enlightenment period that's coming, the people of the Earth will meet the people of the universe. Whoa. All my UF friends go, told you so, John, told you, told you. Yes. There are aliens to our reality, and you have to understand, coming into this world required a long period of development. The only way to get in here physically and with your soul is through a woman. I don't know if you realize that or not. <laughs> That's the only way. But it takes a lot for a celestial being to make a transition into a three-dimensional physical reality and gradually build into a functioning being in that reality. The aliens that haven't been here before are trying to figure out how we do this. That's why sometimes you see these uh, uh, events in which they've been looking at the genitalia of uh, cows or the birthing mechanism of animals and all attempting to understand this because they don't see how we can pull this off. It is a magnificent shift 
that we learned over a long period of time and have become very good at. And so we are a rare group called the Morning Stars, and he says, we're the people of the earth, and we will meet the people of the universe, and eventually we will be in a fully enlightened period, which I'll save for later. Got to keep moving here. How do we incarnate? The soul, this is one of my favorite uh, wood carvings I ever found that seems to show the beautiful dynamic of your soul self. Notice how light she is. She's smiling. She's holding the flower over her heart. Everything the artist uh, draws with her is uplifting, flowing upward, and her crown chakra and all. And then here's the dense containing physical body that she's going to enter that's your soul coming in to physical incarnation and it comes in through the fontanelle in the baby body the portal into the human body is your fontanelle and Edgar says then it seals over and you are encased for a sojourn yikes you see how that happens your soul came into the uh, nervous system of this little baby vehicle that your mom and dad made using the forces of nature and pushed its way into the brain and into the spinal column. Now if you read Ecclesiastes in the Bible carefully you will actually see a secret teaching in there. The preacher of Ecclesiastes says the golden bowl must be broken or open and the silver cord your spinal column and nervous system, the silver cord must be loose and dust must return to dust and the soul to God who gave it. Hint, hint, you know, deep meditation discussion right there or a glorified uh, death, but usually a deep meditative connection. Open the golden bowl, loose the silver cord, rise up with the soul and leave the body still. And Edgar, when he was teaching meditation, would often say, set the earthly concerns aside. Set them aside, sort of that's the prep. And then arise my soul and expand. So here's how you came in. And uh, this wood carving, I think, is so beautiful. There you are in that condition, and here you are in, totally contained in a physical organism, and that organism is going to change, go through changes and all, and you're going to have to adjust to those. Here's Patanjali in the Yoga Sutras, and believe it or not, he gives us the key that this physical organism that's so wonderful for physical operation is secretly designed for metaphysical experience. And he points out to you that the medical, uh, he doesn't do it literally, but when you study what he does, it relates literally to the medical caduceus, or the staff of mercury, it was called in ancient times. So the white circle and the golden shaft is, see my brain and my spinal column going down, your cerebrospinal system. The double serpents, everybody wonders, are Ida and Pingala, right out of Yoga Sutras. But they relate to your autonomic nervous system, which has two parts the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Casey taught all of this to people who really wanted to learn. The sympathetic is that part of your nervous system that reacts to things, sympathy to the condition, so fight or flight, all of that, that's the sympathetic. The parasympathetic, once you relax, comes in and tries to restore the body, re-nourish the body, rebuild the body, and that's part of your autonomic system. Now, over here, I've got the chakras because Casey related the chakras to the endocrine glands. And you see on the right is a female body and on the left is a male. The body has two sides. And so the root chakra on the male are the testes. And on the female, on the right side, are the ovaries. Don't worry if you had a hysterectomy. These are psychic dynamic centers first, physical uh, tissues secondly so you still can have compensation. One of the problems with this uh, medical drawing is the navel chakra is not drawn, but they know about it. They publish it in other works. It's called the cells of Leydig, named after the doctor who found them. So the navel chakra could have been on here. It, they would have called it the cells of Leydig, and that's the endocrine gland of that center. 
Your solar plexus center are the adrenal glands and the pancreas. Uh, this is the powerful adrenaline. You know how quickly you can pump that into your system. Hormones are secreted by the endocrine glands, and they are powerful. If you're not aware of that, just ask any woman in this audience. She will explain it to you. Hormones are super powerful immediately in the bloodstream. And imagine adrenaline, how quickly adrenaline. And any of you who have pumped some adrenaline know how long it takes to get it out of your bloodstream once you get it in. The heart chakra is not the pump, but the thymus gland, which became famous due to AIDS. It's the producer of the T cells that really build your immune system. So you see, it became very famous when we realized an illness that destroyed the immune system. We started to learn about the thymus, because otherwise we didn't know much about it. The thyroid gland is the throat chakra. And then this brain is turned sideways so you can see the two glands in the brain, or this gal has had a serious car accident. <laughs> the first is the pineal gland, dead in the center of your brain sometimes called the pineal body. And then you come over to the large frontal lobe of your brain and hanging just underneath it, behind the brow of your head and just above the palate in your mouth, right there and your temples, is the master glands of the body, the hypothalamus and the pituitary. And they are the master glands of the body. When you imagine now, Casey's trying to tell you you have the most powerful features secretly built into your body to transform your energy. You do. Just start meditating a little bit or awakening your mind to higher thoughts and your hormones change. Immediately the master gland says, whoa, what's he trying to do? Let's change the message throughout the body. Now, do you realize what you're doing? You are sending new messages new hormones throughout your system that create healthier, more holistic, more interconnected sense of oneness of your being and higher purpose. You're going to see this later in a Casey reading when I get to it. This is a very powerful stuff. You also need to know that your whole self has yin and yang, both masculine and feminine. This is Shiva and Shakti here. And believe it or not, this is clearly explained in Genesis, the book of the Bible. You won't believe it, I know. Chapter 2, verse 18 to 25, God says, they are lonely here. And you may not realize it, but Adam with a lower A in Hebrew means a being, a person, not a man. But English Bibles in Genesis translate lower A Adam, man. It's unfortunate. But here's what really bugs me. In the book of Numbers, they don't. They translate it person. Ooh, I, think, I just hope I'm not one of those idiots who did that. Also, also you need to know this. The Hebrew word for rib, selah, the Hebrew word for rib is actually the same Hebrew word for side. And here's what gets me. When God describes building the Ark of the Covenant to Moses, he uses that word for the sides of the Ark. Oh man, did they do a disservice in Genesis to shift it to the word rib in English, when literally it means a side of the person. The whole Adam with the little a has, is androgynous, has male and female in it. God says they're lonely in this duality. He casts a deep sleep over the androgynous Adam being and pulls out the feminine, the yin energy to make us separate and these two can companion with one another. And the first Hebrew word used to describe her is kava, life giver. Kava means the life giver. That is in each of us, no matter what gender you're sitting in right now, you have both of these forces within you. The depth psychologist Carl Jung actually says, John, you can't be fully conscious. You can't reach full consciousness unless you get in touch with your feminine, right? Males have to get in touch because what's just beyond the veil of my masculine projection? The feminine essence of my whole psyche. Do you see that? And women know this too. You're projecting the feminine, the yin of your 
whole self, of your whole psyche, and therefore if you want to be more fully conscious, you've got to get in touch with your masculine, which is just behind the veil. Carl Jung called it animus for the yang and anima for the yin. And he explained that a, a man like me who has a dream of a female of some special quality, not necessarily one I know out here, but a feminine in my dream is probably my anima. And I, my soul and I are communicating. You ladies, if you have a dream of a distinct male in your dream, not one you know out here necessarily, but it could be if you use them as a symbol, but generally no, that could be your animus, the essence of your soul self and the two of you are communing. Do you see that? That was Carl Jung's idea, very interesting. And you just need to be aware that, that you have these. It doesn't mean I'm gonna become more feminine or woman-like, not at all, but I'm more in touch with the qualities of the yin, the intuitive, the nurturing, all of those qualities. And it means you're gonna become in touch with the qualities of the yang. Also, uh, we have soulmates. And now Edgar Casey gave us a great insight into this when one lady came to him and said, asked, is my soulmate incarnate while I'm on the earth? And he said, yes, about 30 of them. <laughs> what? She, what? He's, uh, you're focusing a little too much on the mating. Soulmate are souls that you have traveled with so much that you guys have an, a, a magnetic attraction to one another. And she said, well, how would I pick the right one? And he said, that depends on your ideals. What are you looking for? When I read that reading, I thought to myself, well, heck, what was my ideal at 18? <laughs> yeah, you know. What was, <laughs> what was my ideal at 28? 38, 48, 78. Do you see? So if, if two souls are really going to bond, even though they have the soulmate dynamic attraction to one another, they have to also be able to change as the ideals change, at grow as transition grows. That makes, if you've been married long enough and it's a good marriage, you know that deep, easy love that builds over a long period of time. It's just magnificent to experience that. So, but you have to understand that you have to make shifts because life is gonna change, so are your ideals. Um, our soul does not die, never ever. And Edgar said the first 10 minutes after death, you're gonna become aware of that and it might startle you that you're still alive. And he said in 1930s that in the late 60s and 70s, you're gonna have a new understanding of death and what occurred in that period? The medical profession became so sophisticated that you could die on them and they could bring you back to life. The problem was what occurred in the recovery room. And it went something like this. The doctor would walk in and say, boy, we had a close one with you. And the patient would say, yeah, I was amazed when you jumped up on my chest like that. And the doctor would go, wait a minute, you were dead on the table. Yeah, I thought it was strange too, but I was standing over in the corner and the nurse did this, you did that. And these doctors simply gathered these stories and started publishing them in the early 70s. Now there are over 30 books on this on Amazon.com uh, and probably another hundred of crazy ones. I've looked at them too. But here is the idea that your soul self does survive and it's a little startling to you uh, once the death occurs that you still find yourself. But notice, I don't have my vocal cords anymore to vibrate your eardrums. So you can't hear me because it, my vocal cords are laying dead on the table. I don't have the surface of my skin to reflect light into your, the cones of your eyes. So there is a startle that occurs. Wait a minute, they don't see me or hear me. Yikes, what has happened? And Edgar says you gradually out of that searching, move into your deeper self and gradually move into your soul consciousness, your subconscious. So here are some of the books, and this is Eben Alexander who came out with the Proof of Heaven book and some lady I don't know. <laughs> All right, soul growth, Casey points out the pearl. You know, Tib has told you an awful lot about stones. Well, Edgar did indeed talk about stones. And he said, if you would carry a pearl, 
It would help you with some of the hard parts of life because he says, how does the oyster make a pearl? It's an irritant that gets into the oyster. And by facing that irritant and over a period of time constantly working with this, it makes the beautiful iridescent pearl. And that makes a beautiful soul engaging with the challenges of your life. Um, the Egyptians knew this, and they said, dung happens here. <laughs> and they taught that the dung beetle was an example of resurrection. So they said, the dung of, in the dung of your life, you have the greatest opportunity to plant a seed like the dung beetle does into that ball of dung, and they would roll it to the morning sun, toward the morning sun. By high noon, that little ball of dung and that seed were smoking hot, and the seed would burst forth with new life, and that's why they drew this wonderful symbol of the winged scarab with the uh, consciousness of God, raw consciousness, and in its little back legs are yin and yang the circle is yin the shaft is yang uh, also the circle symbolizes infinity and the shaft symbolizes temporality so your temporal life and your infinite life have united your feminine and masculine have united you have resurrected you've spread your wings and you've risen out of all the hardships even depth psychologists will tell you and aa and all those wonderful organizations will tell you in your greatest weakness lies your greatest potential for strength. Because if you engage that and are victorious with it, you have overcome something amazing and you have gained a terrific soul power in yourself and in your mind. And you'll never be the same again having to do it. So dung is an important part of your life. <laughs> Hardship and trouble. Uh, Here's Casey on soul growth. Never think too highly of yourself and never belittle yourself too much. You have almost lost hold of yourself at times in feeling sorry for yourself. You have nothing to feel sorry for. God is just as mindful of you, though you have made a wreck of some people's lives. <laughs> and you will to meet that or it, but that you are alive that you are conscious, that you have the opportunity in this period to apply yourself to the reconstruction of what man is to look forward to should encourage you to know that God is mindful of each soul. Then use the abilities that you have, and you have many. You are created in the image of the creator of the entire cosmos. Latent within you are immense talents, abilities. In AA, they come out and they talk about making amends. Don't surrender. Don't give up. Get up and improve. Reconstruct the positive. Take hold of the opportunity. And it's just a wonderful, uplifting, strengthening, illuminating uh, victory over uh, some of your challenges, some of your weaknesses. Edgar said, the fruits of the Spirit, if you apply these, these will transform you because the seeds and the fruits of the Spirit create the Spirit anew. Do that which is good, for there has been given in the consciousness of all the fruits of the Spirit, fellowship, kindness, gentleness, patience, long-suffering, love. These be the fruits of the Spirit. Against such there is no law. Doubt, fear, avarice, greed, selfishness, self-will, these are the fruits of the evil forces. Against such there is a law. Self-preservation, then, should be in the fruits of the Spirit. And you seek through any channel to know more of the path from life to life, from good to good, from death unto life, from evil unto good. Seek, and you shall find. Meditate on the fruits of the Spirit and the inner secrets of the consciousness and the cells of the body become aware of the awakening of life in their activity through the body. In the mind, the cells of the mind become aware of the life in the Spirit. The Spirit of life makes not afraid. Then know the way for those that seek may find. That's an absolute promise. Here's one of the fruits of the Spirit, kindness. And here's Richard Carlson, the author of Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, and it's all small stuff. <laughs> Choose being kind over being right, and you'll be right every time. 
And I have to share with you that the first 20 some years of my life, I was the guy who everything had to be right. And I was always firm about that. And then I read this book and it changed me tremendously. Somehow my self will of being right and making sure everyone else was right was suspended for a while while I just tried to be kind. And in that, I would be right every time, and it changed me. It shifted me from a mental mindset, willful set, to a heart, caring, tenderness, and people started to really like me. <laughs> <laughs> Who hadn't liked me much prior to that. <laughs> Here's Paul on love. Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, it is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice into unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails another powerful fruit of the Spirit. I have on occasionally intentionally spent a day only projecting the Spirit of love. And I went through the whole day and it was marvelous, helpful to everyone else, except I noticed occasionally they'd get over to the water fountain and said, have you seen John today? He's, you know, a little strange. Because <laughs> we normally don't do this. But I want to explain you have to have the right heart. Edgar Cayce said, using the same methods, the same concepts, you can make a godling or a Frankenstein depending on your heart, on your motivation, on why you're doing it. In the Eastern world, they teach that the bird of paradise has one wing that is the right technique, the right concepts, the right practice, but the other wing is the right heart and the bird of paradise does not fly with one wing. So you must always examine your motivations, your heart. Why am I doing this? And when you s awaken to that and are alerted to that and you shine your light into your heart all the time, you grow fast. You grow very fast. Of course, karma. So there are things you're going to have to meet. And when they come before you, say, hmm, why has this appeared before me? Why, have, why has this happened? And what am I to learn here? Or if it's something inside you, an illness or a shift in your attitude or something, you say, why am I feeling this? Why am you, you know that it's coming so that you can grow. The, the challenges in your life are actually opportunities for soul growth. Grace, Casey talked about, as one sets itself to accomplish that which is creative, life-giving, uplifting, influence, no longer is the entity under the law of cause and effect or karma, but rather in grace. And I wrote this book with all of his stuff in there. Uh, the mystery of grace is found in Jesus saying, not one jot or tittle will be erased from the law. When I first read that, I thought, well, there's no hope for me. He said, uh, of course, the law is well expressed. Uh, whatever you do with your free will, you experience. And the kids in high school have the saying, what goes around comes around. Um, and, but Jesus said, now learn what this means. I seek mercy, not sacrifice. And here is the mystery in the law. What goes around comes around. If you start understanding mistakes, weaknesses, vices in other people, the law is still in effect understanding comes back upon you. If you forgive what someone said or did, the law is still in effect. Forgiveness comes back upon what you said or did. And Lord help you if you forget they said it. And if you've ever been married, you know what it's like three years down the road to have someone say, three years ago you said this. <laughs> you go, what? I don't even remember that. But if you forget, the law is in effect. It's forgotten what you said or did. This is the power and why Jesus said not one jot or tittle will be erased because the law is perfect. As you emote, as you give out, as you think, so does it come back upon you. Just shift what you're expressing, shift what you're thinking, and you begin the journey through grace. Here's a deep one I wanna share with you. Um, in the Revelation in chapter 12, John, who's having an ecstatic experience with the Spirit, sees a divine female in the heavens, standing on the moon, 
12 stars around her head and the, the light of the sun illuminating her and she's pregnant. And John knows she's about to deliver his fully developed, fully aware divine self again. She's going to give birth to it. But swooping around her is a great red dragon ready to swallow that baby as soon as it comes out. And John starts to cry. And the archangel Michael comes up to John and says, See the dragon? That's the serpent of the garden, grown big and strong now. And John starts to really weep because nobody's going to save the birth of his divine self. Darn! He has conceived it in the womb that she represents of his own consciousness, but he still has a problem. And then Michael and his legions ride out, and they drive the, sur the uh, big dragon away. And she bursts the baby and ascends to heaven, and John is just overjoyed but stunned. So Archangel Michael comes back to John and says these strange words. Now the accuser has been driven out of heaven because Michael and his legions drove the red dragon away. Who's the accuser? John. John's self-judgment. John's guilt. John's self-doubt. I am not worthy of this. As long as you keep that thought up, as long as you keep that thought up, you block your potential because God gave you free will and will not take it away from you. If you can simply let go of self-judgment and know God is all merciful, all understanding, Michael and his legions will drive that serpent that whispered to you in the garden and brought you into this whole mess away and you can birth your true self, mature psyche and ascend into heaven. Thank you. 